Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is May 9th, 2016, and before today's interview, I want to remind listeners that we've added a new feature at econtalk.org, the extras, opportunities for further discussion or ways to check your knowledge of an episode. I also encourage you to follow me on Twitter. My handle is econtalker. If you'd like to know about upcoming episodes or the opportunity to read books in advance, And finally, I want to say that Econ Talk is now on SoundCloud. It's been on Stitcher for a while, if that is useful to you. And now for today's guest, Leif Winar. He holds the Chair of Philosophy and Law at the School of Law, King's College, London, and is the author of Blood Oil, Tyrants, Violence, and the Rules that Run the World, published by Oxford University Press. Leif, welcome to Econ Talk. Real pleasure to be with you, Russ. Our topic for today is the world trade in oil and the moral and political and economic consequences of that trade that you discuss in your very provocative uh, book, Blood Oil. And I want to mention to parents listening with children that we may explore some of the more brutal elements uh, in the world trade for oil, so uh, be prepared if you're listening with your children. I want to start with uh, the resource curse. Uh, What is it? So, Russ, think about some of the big stories that we've been hearing from overseas in our lifetimes. I mean, now we've got ISIS and Assad dropping barrel bombs on his own people, Syrian refugee crisis, Putin uh, going into Syria and also into Crimea not so long ago, a little back farther back, Gaddafi and Saddam, Al-Qaeda in 9-11, the Saudis spreading this extreme strain of Islam worldwide. Uh, if you were as old as I am, you remember the Soviet surge ahead of us in the nuclear arms race, uh, the Iranians' incessant spreading of terrorism around the world. All of those stories that we've been hearing all our lives have one thing in common. All of those threats and crises come from states that export oil, and that is a big part of the resource curse. Now, you st- take a provocative turn, twist on that that curse, uh, it's usually focused on the people who have the resources. So you make a really uh, wonderful uh, analogy I, f- I felt between drugs and alcohol on the one hand and oil on the other. So uh, talk about the range of relationships, just like drugs and alcohol, that people can have with oil and why it and how it varies across countries. So an oil-producing state is a little bit like a person who's addicted to alcohol or drugs. And as we know, it's very dangerous to be addicted to alcohol and drugs. If you take a lot of them, then you're really risking trouble. Now, there are in our history some individuals who have been addicts and have done great at their jobs. You can think of Winston Churchill, for example, the greatest Briton, as they as they call him, or John F. Kennedy, who was addicted to uh, various kinds of painkillers. Those addicted people are unusual in that they did very well by their addictive substance. But in most cases, addiction to alcohol or drugs can be really dangerous to a person's constitution. Similarly, exporting a lot of natural resources can be really dangerous to a country. So, for example, think of the resource-rich states that we know of that have run into such trouble, not only the ones that I've mentioned in the Middle East, Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and also Russia, Sudan, and Syria, but think about the terrible war in the Congo over these metals that go into our cell phones or our laptops, or those terrible blood diamonds that came out of the war in Sierra Leone that went into our engagement rings and our earrings. There's something about exporting a lot of resources which can cause real difficulties in the politics and in economics of the country. Oh, we understand that because it's a it's a prize in a, in essence, and the person or people who control that prize um, have a lot of power and a lot of wealth. And yet, as you point out, 
there are countries that have lots of resources that manage to somehow uh, do well by their people. Uh, Norway is an example. Botswana is an example. The United States would be an example. So what's different about those countries relative to the more depressing cases you mentioned? Here's the big difference. And this is what people can think of about natural resources. Is the government accountable to the people? So if a government is accountable to the people, when all this resource money starts to come in, well, then the people can make the government use that money for public goods. So you mentioned Norway. It's a great case. They got lots of money from their oil. And the government is accountable to the people there. So the people have made the Norwegian government save that money for the future. And their pension fund, the equivalent of our Social Security, is funded for decades in advance. If the money comes in when the government's accountable to the people, then it makes the people better off. But if the money goes to an authoritarian ruler, it gives that ruler a chance to rule without being accountable to the people at all, and in fact to oppress them. And if it goes to, an, if it goes to a rebel group or an armed group, as we see, for example, in Iraq or we saw in Libya, then the group can use the money from the resources to buy more weapons and to cause more chaos in their country. So the big question is, is the government accountable to the people when the oil money comes in, when the diamond money comes in? If yes, then good. If no, then real trouble might be in store. So one of the examples that you talk about at length is Saudi Arabia, which on the surface could you could argue is a fairly uh, benevolent place uh, for its people, somewhat benevolent in certain dimensions at least. There's government provision of health care, education, uh, per capita uh, income is very high. And, of course, it's often high in, in these countries, although it's very unequally distributed. So the average or per capita is a very bad measure of the well-being of the people. So at one extreme, we might have Saudi Arabia, which seems like some of that oil money is going toward the people. The other extreme, we might have Equatorial Guinea, which is a, a horrific example of, of how le the leader has abused his, his people and taken that money. And, of course, it's always at risk uh, in, a, in a dictatorship, in an authoritarian regime. So there's a lot of terror spread often by the leader for, to his own people just to keep that prize in, in his own hands. But talk about those two extremes and whether we should make a distinction between them, say, Equatorial Guinea on, on the one hand, which is uh, absolutely horrific, and Saudi Arabia, which is perhaps somewhat horrific. Uh, but in both cases, you, you argue that in – excuse me, in neither case do the people control the resource. And yet you could argue Saudi Arabia is not so bad. Uh, push back against that as you do in the book. It's the key point here is that the people should ultimately control the resources. So if the government is accountable to the people, things go well. If it's not accountable to the people, you get real trouble. The country really ultimately belongs to the people, and people should have the ultimate say. What happens to the resources of their country? So you've mentioned the two different cases of an authoritarian regime and the two extremes of the strategies that authoritarians are, use oil to stay in power uh, – Take, uh, take advantage of. On the one hand, there's a terrible African dictatorship of Equatorial Guinea, where the president stays in power by using his oil money, mostly for coercion. And the prisons are terrible, and he locks up uh, any dissidents and notorious torture uh, facilities in that country. So there, it's mostly coercion as a strategy of divide and rule. In Saudi Arabia, the strategy is partly coercion. The Saudi security forces, the religious police are extremely extremely vigilant and severe, but Saudi also spends a lot of money dividing its people by paying them off, essentially, putting them into useless government jobs where they hardly even have to show up, and paying them, essentially, just to be quiet. Now, we don't actually know much about how the Saudi people like this deal. The Saudis, as far as we can tell, do seem to think that the Saudi people own the resources of their country, and it's not really possible to ask them how they feel about this deal where the royals take all of the oil money and spend a huge amount on themselves and decide to give some fraction of the rest to the people to keep them quiet. That strategy has been affected for so, so far. But let me just mention that Saudis have done another thing to keep in power besides coercion and patronage, which is to really insist on this extreme 
intolerant version of Islam, not only within their own country uh, to get their own people to support the regime, but they've been spreading it around the world for decades, perhaps the biggest ideological campaign of all time. The Saudis have been funding madrasas and mosques and study centers around the world, and this very intolerant, anti-Christian, anti-Jewish, anti-other strains of Islam, versions of Islam that they've been insisting on, has bedded down around the world, and that's the version of Islam that we now see mutating into jihadi extremism, not only in the Middle East and in Asia, but also in Paris and Brussels, and perhaps even here in the United States. So the question then is, well, first of all, I guess the question would be, should we do something about that? Should we care about it? One of the, the powerful parts of the book is that, of course, it's not just that. There have always been dictators that don't treat their people particularly well. Uh, there's always a question of what should be done about it if you're on the outside, if if there's anything to be done. With the, Of course, there's the law of unintended consequences, which um, rears its head very badly, unfortunately, or not in, in these foreign policy situations. So one view says, well, you know, there's these bad places around the world, and that's really nothing to be done about that effectively. It's hard to do anything real about it. The part that's depressing that you chronicle so well is that you and I are funding it. I go down to the pump and I fill up my car, and sure, most of the gas comes from the United States. It's consumed in the United States, but we do import, still import quite a bit. And, of course, the world trade in oil keeps the price of the United States low, so we benefit – financially from the trade in oil around the world and still that trade itself and the price of gasoline is funding really horrible things uh, that people are doing to their people so again it's one thing to say well you know maybe the people of Saudi Arabia deserve more of their own money than they're getting uh, but the real problem is that you and I are keeping those regimes in place and um we don't want to confront that, do we? That's right. It's it's a fact that's been hidden for a while, but once you see it, it's hard to miss. So it's true in a sense that there will always be dictators, there will all be poverty, but there's something really special about these oil states in particular. So let me just mention one fact. Think about all the progress that the developing world has made since 1980, China's rise, India's rise. The oil states as a group in the developing world are no richer, no freer, and no more peaceful than they were in 1980, and that's remarkable. All the money going into those countries has not made the countries richer, freer, or more peaceful. And why is that? Well, it's because our money is going to authoritarian rulers and rebel groups, and that's the key to the oil curse. It's the rule that we use for deciding to who to buy oil from that's causing this trouble. So when we go to the pump, we might be putting Saudi oil or Angolan oil or Equatorial Ghanaian oil into our pump, and our money, and our cars, I'm sorry, and our money will be going back to those men to help them maintain their repressive rule and to buy more torture chambers and, and helicopter gunships and so on. It's our money that are keeping the men of blood in power in foreign countries. Our money is actually making those men um, stronger. That's the problem we need to address. And you make a very powerful analogy with um, the slave trade that even though the world, many parts of the world that uh, traded in slaves or traded in the products that slaves created, benefited materially from that trade. The moral case was so overwhelming. People said, well, I'm just – I don't care. I'm, uh, it's wrong. And so the question is, can you make the case – obviously, uh, most of us benefit tremendously here in the United States and in the Western world and much of the world. We benefit tremendously from the world – the current situation with world oil, particularly right now where the price happens to be relatively low. Um, so it's really unpleasant to think about having to give some of that up, uh, to stand up for the principle of, of, uh, not cooperating with tyrants. And we'd also have to confront the question, which we will, well, is it actually going to help the people we're talking about here? Because that's, that's the question I care about a lot as an economist. But if we just think about the moral question of whether we should be complicit in this activity, it's a lot like slavery. 
It is. In fact, it's the same rule that we're using now for oil that we used to use for slavery. So let's go back 300 years ago. Back then, in this very violent era, the rule for almost all of international affairs was the rule of might makes right. Violence created legitimate power. So back then, our rule for human beings was whoever can seize them by force can sell them to us. And that was the rule that made the Atlantic slave trade legal, under which 12 million Africans were forced through the terrible Middle Passage where they were bought legally as property here in the Americas. So might makes right used to be our rule for human beings, and we've abolished that rule now. But might makes right is still our rule for the resources of other countries. Our rule for the resources of other countries is whoever can seize the resources by force can sell us, sell them to us. And that's the rule that puts us into a business relationship with the men of blood abroad. Now, of course, this rule makes no sense from a basic market perspective. Our rule is that violence overseas will create legal property rights in the United States. And that is a violation of central market norms. I mean, imagine that in your cell phone is a small piece of the Congo that was extracted at gunpoint by one of those vicious militias in the Congo that have been doing such horrible things to women over the last dozen or so years in an effort to keep themselves in power in that chaotic region. Well, if that piece of the Congo is in your phone, you still own every molecule of your phone 100% under the laws of the United States. Violence there creates property rights here. That's an anti-market rule that we still use, and that's the rule that's causing the trouble. Now, if I can go back to one other thing you just mentioned, a very intuitive point that we benefit from this violation of market norms um, in getting stolen goods all the time, it might seem like we're getting a good deal, just like it might seem we're getting a good deal by buying a stolen car from a carjacker instead of going to a showroom. Sometimes it seems cheaper to violate property rights. But go back to those first examples I gave about the oil curse. Look how much trouble the oil curse ends up causing the world, ends up causing us. Best estimate we have is the United States spends about 67, 68 billion dollars a year on our military protecting the global supply of oil. And the latest estimate for how much we spent in the most recent war in Iraq is around 2.4 trillion. That's serious money. That is serious money that we spend to try to keep oil cheap. And we have to add that price on to what looks like a lower price at the pump. So I have to say, um, I'm a, I'm a free trader and I was I'm a pretty hardcore free trader and I'm not, I'm not particularly sympathetic to fair trade uh, ideas. And these are somewhat what we're going to talk about as ways to deal with these issues that you've raised or have some relationship to fair trade. They're basically saying, well, you don't always just trade with countries. You don't always freely engage, uh, even if it might seemingly make you better off. It might not really, but we don't um, – uh, maybe we shouldn't just trade freely. We maybe should restrict some kinds of trade. And I was talking to my 18-year-old son about the ideas in your book and how provocative and, and – um, persuasive some of them were and he said dad that's the least you thing i've ever heard you say uh because what you force uh it's a very clever rhetorical device to say this is uh, anti-market but uh because it's forcing us to uh basically acknowledge theft you're suggesting as part of of uh a global trade but the real question is you know having made the case that uh, foreign trade in oil is is making us both complicit with really evil people, some of them, and as and possibly hurting us more than we fully imagine uh, in terms of its overall consequences. That leaves us with the question then of what is to be done about it, because I think when you tell people these kind of things, uh, there's a temptation to say, well, but that's just the way the world is. You know, there's really nothing practical to be done about it. Sure. I, I maybe I should feel a little guilty that I'm funding uh, a vicious dictator who 
uh, tortures people in order to keep power. But, you know, really, that's just that's just it's just bad things in the world. There's nothing really to be done. And it's true that might makes right doesn't seem so right in 2016. But we don't really have a better idea of how to how to get there from here. So uh, what are you recommending or what would you suggest we do uh, to do this? And I'm just make one more point, because, you know, in, in my lifetime, there have been many suggestions to boycott various products, various um, uh, countries trade, whether it was uh, China for its so-called slave labor, uh, whether it was grapes when uh, migrant workers were allegedly poorly treated. And when I'm confronted with those, I always ask the question, does this help the people you claim to be worried about? So in the case of China, you know, if China actually had slave labor making its its products, I'd be very uninterested and in, in, I wouldn't want to – not uninterested, that's the wrong word. I would be interested in trading with them. I wouldn't want to trade with them. So I don't want to be complicit in slave labor on purely moral grounds. I don't consider low-wage workers slaves and I think our trading with them actually makes them better off. So I always – actually find myself wanting to suggest the opposite of many of these international campaigns. Let's buy lots of stuff from that migrant workers pick, like grapes, because that'll increase the demand for their services, push up their wages. Let's buy lots of Nike shoes that are made in Indonesia or Vietnam or wherever. And the evidence is that a lot of these people who make these low wage low wages actually have been improved over time by trade, not by not trade. And it's not always clear that not trade is, is a way to make them better off. So my question is, in this particular case, you make a pretty good case that some of the, the – there is some actual slavery here, effective slavery. So what am I to do about that? If I as an individual say, well, I'm not going to buy gasoline from Equatorial Guinea, I can't really do that. That's the problem you confront in the book in terms of trying to find solutions, Correct. That's true. <clears throat> and you raised a lot of points. So let's take those three and separate them out. First is the really interesting fundamental point about the foundations of economics, about property rights and theft. And the second is whether our trade makes people better off overseas. And then the third is what we could possibly do about this problem. And I'm so happy to talk to you and uh, your listeners about the first point, because I know that you're a student of history and Adam Smith and the philosophy of the market. And I did my PhD with Robert Nozick on property rights, and I edited a book on F.A. Hayek. So this fundamental point is really important to me. The question is, do we have a free market in oil today? really just on a basic level, and that might seem obvious we do, but let me ask about this first. Did they have a free market in human beings 300 years ago? Now, they were human beings who were sold across borders and money changed hands and property rights uh, certificates were, were traded too. Prices but, emerged and were not under, under anyone's control. That's right, so they had a market in people but we now believe that actually they were selling things that they ought not have the right to sell. Human beings should not be property, so they actually shouldn't have been sold. It's not the case that everything that can be sold should be sold. You think about passports or nuclear weapons. So there was a market because they had a wrong idea about who had the right to sell human beings. In today's world, we have something of the same situation. There's nothing wrong with selling oil as such, but who is getting the right to sell off the oil of a country? Why does the Saudi regime or that terrible dictator in Equatorial Guinea, why did they get the right to sell off the resources of their country? Now, your first thought is, well, that they're the head of a recognized government, but that's not the answer. Because as I said before, when a rebel group takes over the wells, well, we'll buy our oil from the rebel groups like we did from Libya and even from ISIS in the early days before we put sanctions on. So our rule really is might makes right. And I'm claiming that from a basic market perspective, that makes no sense. I mean, look at it this way, Russ. If you and I got some guns and went down to the Exxon station on the corner and took over the Exxon station, no one thinks that the law should say that we can sell off the oil and keep the money. But... If you and I got some guys together with guns and overthrew the government of Equatorial Guinea tomorrow, then the next day the world would say we have the right to sell off the oil of that country and keep the money. So on the basic philosophical level, 
we don't have a free market in oil. We have guys with guns selling off the oil of the country that belongs to the people of the country. But they're not under our jurisdiction, right? And we don't have international law in the sense of a of a one world global set of property rights. And so this fact that jurisdictions have limited power only within their borders raises a very naughty question. The other naughty question, that's with a KN, not an N-A-U-G-H, but the other naughty question is if only if I'm only trading with morally upright countries, who can I trade with? I mean, can't you make the same argument in the United States? We stole our, you know, a lot of our oil right now is coming out of Oklahoma and Texas, Pennsylvania, South Dakota, a lot of fracking going on. Those are regions that were once uh, held by Native Americans that we exploited and took their stuff. And now we call it ours, whatever that means. I mean, who, where, where do you stop? Who, who can you trade with morally? Um, and I mean, it's, it just, it seems on one level, it opens a, a terrible can of worms. Good. Well, worms are not so bad. <laughs> all the time. Let's go back to that first question. So it's absolutely right that there is no international body that determines the rules for trading oil, and we have no jurisdiction over other countries. That's all true. So who is it that decides who we buy oil from? There's no international law about it. Well, we are also a sovereign state. In fact, we decide our own rules about who will buy oil from. It's entirely a decision of every sovereign state to decide who it is who will have the right to sell the oil of other countries to them. Right now, we, like every other country, use the rule of might makes right. That goes against our basic principles. I mean, our basic principles are in the other direction. You know, Abraham Lincoln said in his first inaugural address that a country belongs to its people. That's what we believe as Americans. Every country belongs to its people. So we're still using this bad old rule from the 17th century to decide who to buy oil from. But that's totally our decision. And we could make our own laws align with our own principles and say that we're only going to buy from actors who could possibly have the authorization of the people to sell off the oil. Now, that doesn't mean we could only buy oil from Norway. Thank goodness. I mean, let's just think about it. What would it mean if we decided only to buy oil from those who could possibly have the authorization of the people? Well, it would just mean that the government would have to be accountable to the people for decisions about resources. Can the people find out who's selling the oil, how much they're getting? And if the people don't like what the government's doing, can they protest it without fearing for their safety or their lives? And will the government policy change if a majority of citizens strongly don't like what the government is doing? So we're just talking minimum, bare bones, civil liberties and political rights. That kind of accountability to the people is fairly widespread in our world. Uh, if you divide it up, about 50 percent of the world's oil is sold uh, by governments that are accountable and 50 percent of the world's traded oil is literally, by our own principles, stolen from the people of their country. Let's talk a little bit about that idea of, of what you call popular sovereignty and this issue of the people having a say, the people owning the oil. Uh, you know, of course, a government can, quote, own the oil and keep it for itself or its leaders. It can own the oil and give property rights to that oil to its own citizens in very direct ways. Uh, it it can uh, sell them off to the highest bidder and give the money from the auction to the people in various ways. Um, one of the challenges all these ideas face is, is that the will of the people, popular sovereignty, is, is in many ways not well defined. Right. So you can argue that in certain situations, I mean, I'll, let's take Mexico. Does Mexico have control? Does Mexico have popular sovereignty? Does Venezuela? Does does Russia? Uh, what's different about those cases, if any, between, say, them and the United States? Good. So that's a really important question. Let's say we took Lincoln's principle seriously. A country belongs to its people. And let me just say that this is not a left wing principle or a right wing principle. This is a it's just an American principle. I mean, George W. Bush stood up in the middle of the Iraq war and said that the oil of Iraq belongs to the people of Iraq. And, you know, George W. Bush is no socialist. Well, now you've named two Republicans, Lincoln and George <laughs> W. Bush. And, and those are nice statements. The oil of Iraq belongs to its people. What does that mean yeah. in practice? That's the tough question. 
Good. And let me just mention someone from the other side of the aisle. <laughs> Senator Bob Graham of Florida said the oil of the United of oil off our coasts is the property of the American people. So it's a bipartisan principle. That oil belongs to people. And as you said, all this means is that, you know, the oil ultimately should belong to the people. The government can make decisions about what happens to that oil. The government just has to be minimally accountable to the people when it does so. So in this country, the oil, for example, in the Gulf of Mexico, is auctioned off to private bidders and is privatized and the money goes into the national treasury. That's fine because if the people wanted a different regime in place for our, its, their oil, they could get one. The government is minimally, at least minimally responsible to the people's will. You know, if 100 million Americans were willing to vote and march and go on general strike until we had a different system for the um, auctions of oil in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, then that would, that would happen here. But it's not like that in other countries. In other countries, individual citizens really would risk their lives to stand up and say the oil belongs to the people and the president or the princes can't have any of our money until we give them permission. That would be a very risky thing to do. So let's go through the countries that you mentioned um, and whether the people have popular sovereignty over their resources in these countries. Well, Mexico, they do. I mean, Mexico is in no way perfect. There's a lot of problems in Mexico for sure. But the people there do have minimal, bare-bones civil liberties and political rights and consolidated democracy that if they really disagreed with what the government's doing with their oil, then the government's policy would change. Russia, I don't think so. I mean, Russia's changed quite a bit, even in the last 15 years. But now, I think an individual Russian would be brave if he tried to get together with his fellow citizens and say, the regime is taking our oil and keeping the money. We don't like what they're doing with it, and we insist that the government change its policies. That would be a courageous thing to do. I think you'd probably end up in prison. So Mexico, yes. And Russia, no, if you're worried that it's just making me making these kinds of decisions, let me mention that there are well-established metrics that have been around for a long time that measure the civil liberties and political rights in every country. And these metrics are the kinds of things we can use to decide who we would buy oil from. Of course, the political system is a rather um, opaque box uh, when we think about sovereignty. I, as you talked about, People marching if they didn't like the U.S. selling off oil rights in the Gulf, I couldn't help but thinking. And when you mentioned Senator Graham of Florida, I couldn't help thinking of the fact that there are at least 100 million Americans who would probably prefer to have the market price of sugar uh, be untainted by the quotas that we use in the United States to keep out foreign sugar. Um, most Americans don't know about that. Uh, that's a, a feature, not a bug for the people benefiting from it. But if you ask, if you did a poll and said, should the handful of families who make huge amounts of money by keeping out foreign sugar, should they be allowed to? Most they would say no. But the political system isn't listening to that. Um, now, your point, I guess, would be that if they got really mad and they marched on Washington for cheap sugar um, and, and to stop the exploitation of consumers by this handful of farmers and who grow sugar cane and sugar beets, that we could do it. And so in that sense, there is some sovereignty over trade policy in the United States. But it, it, it's a very um, – it's a loose um, connection there. Wouldn't you concede? I do, and it's good that it's a loose connection because a tighter connection would be difficult. I, I happen to agree with you on the sugar issue. I'm glad we can agree on that. But here's the way I think of it. I mean – the people own the country's resources much in the same way as shareholders own a company. I mean, there's nothing unusual about shareholders who don't know much about or don't keep track of what's happening with the governance of their of the company um, they own stock in. But it would be very unusual and very bad if shareholders could not, could not do anything to influence the actions of the governance of the company. And that's the situation that people in oil-cursed, resource-cursed countries are in. Well, Leif, I think actually we agree on a lot. So um, I'm just pushing back because I, I, I have to um, – I, I find one of the things I find most fascinating, first of all, it's my job as host, but also because I, I, I love the way this issue forces 
uh, you to confront the intersection between political economy, morality, uh, principles about, say, trade or peace or legal uh, rights. I mean, it's a very rich book and we can't do justice to it in an hour. Uh, there's, there's a lot going on in there. And I recommend that readers on uh, various ideologies grapple with with the ideas in the book. But I, it's very appealing to me. Again, I'm making the contrast with fair trade. It's very appealing to me to say that uh, trade in oil is an enormous source of wickedness in the world and is is perhaps um, not morally legitimate. And we, by buying gasoline and oil and natural gas from certain regimes, are complicit in their wickedness. And I think that's something that a thoughtful person has to confront. So let's turn to the question of what could be done about it that would actually make it better. And I, I don't – as I said earlier, I don't have any problem with arguing – I'm just not going to be involved in this. Uh, I'm going to ride a bicycle uh, all the time, and I'm going to heat my home with wood that I chopped myself from my backyard, and I just don't want to be a part of this. Most of us find, would find that very difficult uh, practically. And as and I, b b so the question is, though, the key question is, is there something to be done about that would make the situation better as opposed to just keeping my hands clean? The cover of your book is is two is two hands covered in bloody oil. And so – and say this very well. I'm trying to say is that I understand the argument that says I, I don't want to dirty my own hands, so I'm stepping back. There's another argument that says if I step back, do I improve things for the people I care about? And I, I want to hear – I want to hear the case for what can we do practically as a nation, either politically or as individuals, uh, to reduce the harm that's caused by trade in oil in today's world. Good, and I'm so glad to be able to talk to these with you about these things, Russ, because you and I are engaged in the same process of going deep into the foundations of economics and politics and philosophy and trying to bring these lessons uh, forward. I mean, your book, How Adam Smith Can Change Your Life, is just such a terrific example of this kind of thinking. So we're trying to do the same thing, and, and my line, as you can tell, is that we are every day involved in this trade in blood oil, and we just can't step back from it because oil is not only in our cars when we drive, it's everywhere. I mean, oil is used to transport almost everything we buy, and it's also used to make so many things we buy. Basically, if it's plastic, it's oil, and we smear oil on our face in the morning with cosmetics, and it might be in your waistband, it might be in your shoes or my glasses. Oil is just everywhere. And so all the time when we buy things, whatever it is, we may be sending back money to men who consider us to be their enemies. And this trade that we're involved in does not tend to make people better off. This is why it's a malfunction in the trade system. Unlike the usual case of trade, which is win-win, when it comes to trade using might makes right, our money tends to go to make people worse off. So take that fact I mentioned, the oil states are no richer, no freer, and no more peaceful than they were even in 1980. And then think about other cases about where our money is going. I mean, the genocide in Darfur, this terrible world in the war in the Congo, blood diamonds, Sierra Leone and Angola. About 40% of the resource-rich world lives in severe poverty, and their governments tend to be more corrupt. I mean, you can think of a place like uh, Nigeria, corruption around oil there. So in this case, our money is going to essentially who has the most guns instead of to the people of the country and the guys with the guns are not making life better for the people of the country as they as trade should in the normal case do so it's a great thing to write a book that says hey you're really doing some awful stuff when you're uh, filling up your car you didn't realize it congratulations sleep badly at night um <laughs> and, and the book does that very well in fact um uh, I, I'm just going to read – I just want to read this a little bit of a paragraph here from the book because it's it's so eloquent and um, provocative and it makes you uh, face this. It says, it makes perfect sense for an undergraduate in Manhattan to wake up on a warm Saturday, put on a few clothes and some earphones and go for a run in Central Park. To move in close proximity to hundreds of thousands of strangers of many races and creeds with every expectation of returning home safe and heading to the library.
Contrast this with a woman of the same age in the eastern Congo, who has heard rumors of a dozen men with guns near the village, who must calculate whether it's safe enough to go to the well to get water, and who wants very much not to be assaulted, but even more wonders who will take care of the children if she does not return. Across modern history, identities have changed to make more of the world like Manhattan. So that's the good news. The world is getting a little more peaceful. At least that's the trend. It's a little more safer, but there's still this wickedness in the world, which, again, we all understand. But the idea that that wickedness is funded by oil money is is something that should make us sleep badly at night. So the question then, it's one thing to raise the alarm, but say, hey, this is a bad thing, just like people did about slavery. Um, what's to be done about it? What is your um, – your proposal for how we might move forward besides raising consciousness that this is not a, um, as attractive as it might seem. I'm so glad to be able to tell you at this point, Russ, and I'm tremendously optimistic that we can actually fix this problem. I'm tremendously optimistic that we can, and we will get ourselves out of business with these terrible guys abroad. So I'm in Washington right now, as it happens, I'm going to go over to Capitol Hill after this and try to convince people on Capitol Hill that the United States should pass a bill that just says we will no longer buy oil or other natural resources from authoritarian regimes or failed states. America will pass a law that we taper off all of our imports of blood oil and conflict minerals from foreign countries. And we can do that. We have enough energy now in the free countries. Uh, we don't need conflict minerals from foreign countries. We can get ourselves out of business as a country uh, with these men of blood overseas. It's too hard for us to do this as individuals. We just can't figure out uh, which of our shopping is involved more with blood oil and so on. That's too complicated, and the markets are too opaque. We have to do it as a country. It's a political problem. It needs a political solution. And... The political solution, luckily, is waiting right here for us to take it. It sounds like a big ask for us to stop buying authoritarian oil, but as I mentioned, we don't need that oil anymore. And the principle that we would be using to replace might makes right here is one of the deepest principles of American political morality. All countries belong to their people. And better still, that principle that countries belong to their people, resources belong to their people, is now deeply embedded in primary documents of international law. So if you look at the two big human rights treaties that almost every country has signed, they just say in Article 1, all peoples shall, for their own ends, freely dispose of their natural wealth and resources. So this is a principle that not only America but the world has signed up to on paper – Everybody knows that might make right is a, a crazy anti-market rule, and everyone's agreed on the better rule for resource trade. We've just got to summon the leadership and the political will to move from the bad old rule to a better modern rule and get a genuine free market in natural resources. So let's let's make the um, the parallel with say fair trade. Should we also have a law that says we shouldn't trade with countries? And many people advocate this. We shouldn't. For this, we shouldn't trade with countries that pay their workers poorly or less than a, a certain civilized uh, wage. Well, maybe it's not our, our minimum wage, but let's start with that. Anybody who pays their workers, uh, any country where workers earn less than the U.S. minimum wage, to trade with them is to exploit them, and we're not going to be a part of that. Do you, do you think that's a good rule, and is, or is it different from what you're proposing? There's different, there's different views on that, and people like you uh, tend to think that – it does a lot of good to trade with uh, countries where, for example, there's sweatshop labor. It's a very controversial issue. You have seen a lot of countries that have gone through their industrialization period with sweatshop labor and now are much better off. So that issue of fair trade and labor standards is different from natural resources because at least with um, – sweatshot labor, you have laborers who are voluntarily getting out of the field and going into those terrible factories. The problem there is exploitation, and people have different views on whether exploitation is necessary, part of development, or whether it's just too morally tainted for us to do business with. Well, the other problem is, should, that, is that there are people here who would benefit from not trading with them, and so they push this agenda. It's a what we call right. a bootlegger and Baptist issue here on Econ Talk from Bruce Yandel's work, <laughs> right? That 
There's certain people who yeah. take the moral high ground. Oh, it's terrible to trade with exploited workers. Other people say, yeah, it is terrible because they actually benefit from restricting trade with foreign countries. This case seems a little different, your case. That's um, right. It seems to be mostly Baptists, mostly people who are claiming the moral high ground by not trading with, with dictators. But then the next response, and you deal with this in the book in quite a lot of detail, the next response would be, oh, it's a nice gesture. Suppose we pass that, that law and the United States stops trade and, and it's effective, which is a separate issue. Let's say that it's, it's an actual – we have to determine what's a dictator, what's an authoritarian government. We use some kind of index, as you suggest, and we stop trading with Equatorial Guinea and with other places that are um, evil – um, where the leaders are evil, and that's nice. We, we've cleaned our hands, but are we actually going to reduce the power, the, um, the span of control of those people by this, by this, uh, uh, some kind of law like that? That's right. We will. And let me just say that this policy will have tremendous soft power. Imagine the day where the United States of America actually does the right thing and says that it will no longer be in business for oil with authoritarians. That will put pressure on authoritarian regimes in itself to reform. There's reformers waiting outside the palaces, often waiting inside the palaces to make these kinds of uh, reforms to give people basic civil rights and political liberties. They've been saying they're going to do it for a long time. If the United States stood up and did the right thing, it would be tremendous movement in the right direction. And let me also mention, just from the national security side, if the U.S. stood up and said, we're going to get out of business with those who are attacking and oppressing the peoples of other countries and affirm the rights of all peoples, we would defuse that victimization narrative that jihadis are now using to recruit extremists. Right? That would be the end of this narrative. We would no longer be in business with people that we claim we don't agree with in terms of governance. That would be very powerful. But as so, you point out, if not every nation in the world accepts this argument, which they won't, at least in the short run, uh, maybe in the long run, uh, what difference does it make? They're just going to sell their oil to the, the wicked people will sell the oil to people who are willing to buy it. Our hands will be clean, but there'll be no real impact. They'll just sell more oil to those countries that don't have our uh, this moral uh, concern. That's right. And, and I do want to make a strong moral argument, but I also want to make a strong, hard-headed national interest argument, both for us and for other countries. So the moral argument we've seen a lot, but look at the national interest argument for us. We're spending a huge amount of money on our military trying to keep oil flowing around the world. And if we stopped buying oil from those countries, we wouldn't have to spend quite so much on our military. As you say, if we don't buy that oil, well, then the Chinese might be tempted to buy it instead. And that's correct. They probably would at first. But let's look at Chinese national interests. Do the Chinese want to send their money into a destabilizing Middle East and depend on the Middle East to uh, provide their primary energy imports. Basically, does China want to buy oil from ISIS 2.0 in five or ten years? That's not in their long-term uh, national interest. They don't want to be energy, de energy dependent on the Middle East, which they can see as well as we, is really getting much worse. So the Chinese purely for national interest reasons, also has the incentive to announce, and I only mean announce, that at some point in the future they will no longer be importing blood oil like we won't. If the Chinese make that announcement, well, then the game really will be up for the authoritarian regimes in the Middle East. If they see their customers are disappearing, then there will be reforms in those countries. The people will be given more rights over the resources of their country. But in the meantime, as you point out, um, while we might not be importing oil from Equatorial Guinea, we'll be importing Chinese toys made from oil from Equatorial Guinea. It's just oil in a different shape. Uh, and you actually suggest that we should put tariffs on those products uh, and create a trust fund with the money from those tariffs to refund at some point to the people of Equatorial Guinea because they're not getting the money right now. Uh, do you think that's a viable proposal? I do, and it's just a mechanism to protect property rights. As you can tell, this proposal is really all about property rights. Let's say we actually did believe that the people of this African country, Equatorial Guinea, own the oil of that country. What could we do? Because if we don't buy that oil, as you say, the Chinese will, and then we'll import Chinese toys, which are made out of oil, and we'll be buying that oil secondhand. Well, we can put duties on Chinese goods as they come into the United States, 
So let's say China buys $3 billion worth of oil from Equatorial Guinea. Then we'll put $3 billion worth of duties on Chinese goods as they come into the U.S. And we'll save that money in a bank account for the people of Equatorial Guinea and give it back to them once they've got a minimally decent government in place. That'll protect their property rights. That'll give them the value of the oil that was stolen from them. And it will also give everyone in the world an incentive to improve governance in Equatorial Guinea. So I'm not a big fan of that um, just because I see it as a mechanism that would be abused in all kinds of creative ways by people who would benefit from those tariffs directly, not just from the moral case, the issues we were raising earlier. So I want to propose this different focus. Uh, it's not your focus, but I want to get your reaction to it. So you've proposed a centralized solution, a government, U.S. government saying, basically saying to me, I, am, I Russ Roberts, am not allowed to buy, to be part of the trade with Equatorial Guinea. Uh, on because it would be very difficult for me to make that moral decision on my own. And so you're going to make it for me in the form of some type of legislation that would try to keep those products out of uh, the U.S. part of, of the oil market. I'm thinking about abolition again. So abolition and slavery began as a moral crusade alone, right? And the first steps of it weren't I guess it was a it was a, a dual track. It was there was a political track all along, and then there was the moral outrage track, right? So I, I wonder, is it imaginable that the moral outrage could ever be loud enough that individuals such as as company such as Exxon or or um, uh, Sunoco and others would decide not to trade, not to be part of this business for reasons that would – because it, would, it wouldn't be successful for their own business. That is, could a oil company, based on the moral outrage that you could create from books like this and your testimony and other things, website, uh, which we'll put a link up to, could an oil company offer its products as free from wickedness as a way of gaining market share and put competitive pressure on its competitors – who were not doing that? Well, it's funny. I've actually helped the oil companies out a little bit there. So in a couple of weeks, you'll be seeing on my website, cleantrade.org, there'll be an index of the major oil companies and which ones are doing more business with authoritarian regimes. So if individuals out there do want to take action on uh, this problem of blood oil, they can decide whether to, where to buy gas based on which company is buying is doing more business with authoritarian regimes in the world. Now, when I talk to uh, people in the oil industry, I don't tend to make the, oil, the moral case because you know, these are businessmen and their job is not to uh, particularly to respond to uh, philosophy professors like me. <laughs> their job is to do their business, and I make a business argument to them. But I no, just ask them, but no, how, how's, how's it going for your bottom line? How much money have you made in Iran since 1979? How are you feeling about your assets in Iraq? How are you doing since you were chased out of Sudan in the 1980s? How do you feel about Algeria in the medium term? How's it going for you in Libya? These are really big oil producing countries and our companies are not able to do a lot of business in these countries because of the instability that's coming from the oil curse. They are as oil cursed as we are and simply from a business perspective, they should favor a change in the law that will bring stability to these terribly unstable countries in the Middle East and North Africa. Well, I think you're making the right marketing strategy and trying to convince uh, them. But but I do think that no CEO, no employee, no manager, no down to the lowest level in those companies wants to think that they're helping people uh, be enslaved or tortured or raped or mutilated as, as often as the case, is the case in these in these examples. So there is a moral – I understand they mainly care about profits, but I think you could make the moral case sufficiently loud, which I think you do very effectively in the book, loud enough to get this free trader at this mic to, to think about this as, a, as a, a legitimate cause. I think you could make uh, an impact there, and it's just – it's an interesting idea of how that might, that may, that might play out. Good. Let's work together on that. You, I'll make the business case. You make the moral case. <laughs> we'll convince them together. Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Iran because I couldn't help thinking of um, 
a friend of mine who was at a conference uh, in the it was a conference related to the post Iran deal that was recently made to open up Iran a little bit to the to the Western world and how Western companies were uh, champing at the bit, I think is the correct phrase, to get at that market. Um, oblivious, of course, as as you as I have to concede to the fact that Iran is not a particularly free country. Uh, it is um, uh, has many many unattractive statements coming out of its capital about how people should be treated elsewhere, and we can debate whether that's a uh, response to other problems that they're that we've created in the United States. But the reality is is that that. Those companies are just racing to, to to do business. It's a huge, it's a huge attractive um, opportunity for them, and they're they're going there. Yeah, you know the oil curse is like poison ivy. In the short term, there's a really strong desire to do what will make it worse in the long term. It's the same for our governments. We're always tempted to do business with authoritarians. And how has it worked out? How did it work out when we were supporting the Shah of Iran or Gaddafi or Saddam or now the Saudis? How is that working out? It, it's tough to say that in the long run, U.S. national interests or American corporate interests are furthered by sending our money to whoever has the most guns. I'm going to say something controversial. I actually think that the American people are closer culturally to the Iranian people than they are to, for example, the Saudi people right now, and the Saudi, the Saudi regime is our allies. I have hopes that Iran could one day become... Uh, a country where the people control their own resources. And I look forward to the day, actually, where the Middle East is a region where the people are sovereign and the countries are at peace. That's not going to happen if we keep sending hundreds of millions, billions of dollars to whoever has the most guns. Looking to the long term, the right thing to do and our national interest point in the same direction. Get out of business with the men of blood. Affirm the rights of people in all countries. So here's the irony that I struggle with. And I love the I love the um, love the sentiment again. But um, we boycotted um, the United States has boycotted Cuba, put sanctions on Cuba, forbidden trade with Cuba since uh, the 1960s or late 1950s. I don't know when it started. Maybe you know, but it's been about 50 something years. And recently, President Obama has has liberalized that, or at least taken steps to begin a more open relationship with our two countries. And while I uh, despise the, the Castro regime and um, have nothing good to say about, uh, say, the health care of Cuba or the education of Cuba, the apologies that people make for their repression. Um, I think the the sanctions and the failure to trade with Cuba has allowed Cuba to blame the United States for its economic situation rather than its own policies. It's created a demonization um, potential to to mislead people as they control the press and, and so on. So how is it that not trading with these countries is going to help them be more free? Is it not the case, even though I'm not a big fan of, of, of Iran, is it not the case that by having Western companies there, we have the potential to create a more liberal Iran down the road? So I just have to say again, natural resources are special. There really is a resource curse, and trading in resources does not tend to make the people richer or more free. And it does tend to stimulate civil war, and sometimes it also empowers wars between countries. Resources are highly concentrated uh, sources of economic value, and they're big trouble if they're in the control of authoritarians and armed groups. So resources are special, and... We're not going to be imposing sanctions on countries. Sanctions are punishments. We're just going to be saying, look, who rules in foreign countries is none of our business. But right now, by our deepest principles, these authoritarians and armed groups qualify for none of our business. We don't believe we have the right to buy resources from you guys because we believe your people own the country. Now, unlike uh, sanctions, this is not something that an authoritarian regime can easily turn into a propaganda victory. This is the United States standing up, doing the right thing, and saying, we are on the side of the people now. We're no longer going to send our money to the guys who are oppressing and attacking you. So in response to that, again, I, I salute the, um, the moral clarity of that, but in response to that is... Um Mr. Obiang, the leader of Equatorial Guinea, 
who's uh, desperately, uh, who has this grip on power in a desperate way, uh, been quite successful uh, for a long time in, in abusing his people and profiting from the resources that he, is, that he has, is he going to say, well, I guess I better do better on that Freedom House Index so that I can sell my oil to the United States? Is that likely, is that going to be his response? What do you hope for his response to be? So this guy Obiang has been in power for a long time. He's one of Africa's longest serving leaders. He's been around since 1979. He just won a fake election last week with 93% of the vote. And as I said, his regime is terribly, terribly repressive. Imagine the day when Obiang can't sell the oil of his country off because his customers believe that the oil belongs to the people. That's going to be a tough day for him. I'm not sure if he himself has it within him to reform any more than, say, Mugabe, who also came into power around the same time, has the power to reform himself. But there's another generation of uh, governors coming up in that country. The question for us is, are we going to keep trading with Equatorial Guinea from the next generation just because the next generation can keep the people living in fear and poverty? Or are we going to say someone in the next generation has to come up who minimally represents the people and is accountable to the people for the sale of their primary national asset? And I guess the other argument would be that at least if you lowered the value of the prize of those wells, uh, the willingness of people to kill other people and and brutalize them to get access to that will be reduced. That would be a that would be a big plus in my book. Uh, let's close with what kind of reaction you're getting from two groups, uh, philosopher, fellow philosophers. This is an unusual book for a philosopher to write, seems to me. Uh, I think philosophers should write more books like this, though. I want to, <laughs> I want to emphasize that. Uh, what kind of reaction are you getting from your, your academic colleagues and what kind of reaction are you getting from um, – uh, politicians, is there any? Uh, I think they're probably taking a wait and see attitude. But tell me, uh, tell me if I'm wrong. Well, the politicians are interesting. I'm here in Washington talking to people, and everyone agrees that the analysis is correct. You know, oil is such a huge source of unaccountable power. We can't control it from the outside by um, alliances or military action or sanctions. So we really have to find ways to empower the people of countries so that oil can be made accountable from inside the country. Everyone sees that the analysis is correct. The question is, will the American people stand up and say that we need to get ourselves out of business with the men of blood abroad? So the political consensus needs to form around it, and that's the way these things are. The philosophers are much more uh, encouraging. Everyone sees that this is the kind of issue that philosophers should be engaging with. And, and let me just leave you with a story from when last time I was teaching uh, political Theory 101 uh, at Princeton, I said to the students, you know, look at the people we're reading in this course. Look at the great classics of political philosophy in this course. We're, we're doing Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau and Marx and Mill. I mean, all of those men were deeply engaged in the politics of their time. I mean, Hobbes had to flee the country for fear of his life because of the pl political philosophy he was writing. Locke had to flee the country in fear of his life because of the political philosophy he was writing. Rousseau uh, wrote a constitution for Poland. Mill was a member of parliament. And, you know, they chased Marx from Germany to France and then from France to London, and they still followed him around with the secret police in London. These philosophers were deeply engaged in the politics of their time. And they could see the big picture of their time. That's what gave them the ability to say, this is the problem. Here is the principles we're using now. Here are the principles we could use to make things better in the future. And that's why their work has had enduring value. My guest today has been Leif Wenar. Leif, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. It's been my absolute pleasure, Russ. Thank you so much. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.